Welcome to the Here's Waldo podcast, where we sit down with top visionaries and creatives in the video game industry. Together, we'll unravel their journeys and learn more about the path they're forging ahead. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm Lizzie Mintos, founder and CEO of Here's Waldo Recruiting, a boutique video game recruitment firm. This is the Here's Waldo podcast. In every episode, we dive deep into conversations with creatives, founders, and executives about what it takes to be successful. You can expect to hear valuable lessons from their journey and get a glimpse into the future of the industry. This episode is brought to you by Here's Waldo Recruiting, a boutique recruitment firm for the video game industry. We value quality over quantity, transparency, communication, and diversity. We partner with companies, creatives, and programmers to understand the why behind their needs. We provide a white glove experience that ensures a win-win outcome. Before introducing today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Ryan Lastimosa for introducing us. Today, we have Carl Quo with us. He is the founder of Jam and Tea Studio. He has worked on everything from tabletop, web, mobile, PC, and console games across his career, primarily in a product and game design role. Very modest. We'll get into it more. Let's get started. Thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. What can you share with us about Jam and T Studio? Sure. So we're a new startup. Uh, we just got started in August, uh, and we're building games that bring players together. Um, really specifically, uh, we're focused on building social connection between players uh, in multiplayer games that are really focused on building multiplayer. Um, we're also folks who are really interested in new technology and how it can create great new experiences for players. Um, and so a lot of what we're looking at is how we can leverage things like generative AI um, in ways that are great for creators, but also great for players to create new experiences. Um, and so we're busy uh, prototyping away, working on an action RPG, um, and hopefully we'll have more to share uh, in the coming years. Awesome. Thanks. I love all the new studios that are popping up right now. Yeah. There's a lot going on in the industry. Can you share some background on your journey to get into the video game industry and what led you to founding this studio? Oh, sure. Uh, I think I have a deeply unfair, as I've come to learn, uh, path into the industry in that somewhere in the fifth grade, I decided I was going to make games. And then I just like hyper focused on it until I got it and and never really deviated it never really questioned it i think the biggest question for me was like what i would do in the game industry when i first decided to make games i was going to be a games writer um i was going to write for the video game industry um and then i was going to be a designer and then i decided i needed to learn how to be an engineer because i read an article in gosh it would have been like 1997 that like there are no idea guys in the industry. It's only engineers and artists, and you have to be one of those two things. And I knew I couldn't draw, so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to learn <laughs> to be an engineer. Uh, and then in college, uh, I got a computer science degree, but rapidly learned that I was not an engineer. I didn't like debugging, um, but I was very good at you know putting together presentations, doing documentation, helping the engineers stay organized and on track and build the right thing. And so uh -huh. that turned into um taking a few uh early contract jobs in qa but rapidly transitioning into doing more uh project manager -y production style work um and then it just sort of evolved from there um you know i started in tabletop at games workshop um working on collectible card games and collectible miniature games um and then went to popcap uh and that's really where uh popcap was this interesting piece of the journey for me where they didn't really have anyone called game designer at the time that I was there. Teams were three folks uh, as a core team, and one was a producer, which I was, uh, one was an engineer, and then one was an artist. And everyone was sort of expected to do, expected to do game design. Um, and so I learned a bunch of game design and uh, how to make games there, learned a bunch of stuff. Um, and then uh, went to Riot because I got super into League of Legends um, and decided I wanted to work on games that were uh, more hardcore. Um, this online games as a service thing was uh, blowing up and I enjoyed PC games. And so we had sort of been doing mobile games as a service at PopCap, but I wanted to do PC games as a service. 
Um, and since I was playing an absurd amount of League of Legends at the time, going to Riot made a lot of sense. Um, and so I went there, and then that was sort of this moment in my career where I was like, I feel like I've achieved what I set out to do when I was in the fifth grade. You know, I'm working and making a game that is exactly the kind of game I love to make. So what do I want to do next? Um, you know, and after some thinking about it, I decided that, you know, I wanted to build a studio um, from scratch in order to make the kind of games that I had in my head, make games that I really loved. Um, and I had also increasingly become more about what is the culture of a studio? Like, how do we build teams that make games and how do we think about that stuff? Um, and decided that I had some ideas that I wanted to put into action about that. Um, and so I actually founded my first studio, Ghostly Bear Games, in 2017 um, and ran that for about two years before we uh, unfortunately ran out of money. Um, but that was sort of a crash course in all the things to do, uh, not, not to do uh, the next time, and a bunch of lessons in how to think about startup life and startup journeys. And, um, and it was also ultimately a really rewarding experience. Like, I love the team that came together and worked with me. Um, and, you know, I decided that uh, I wanted to do that again. And so after spending about three years at Phoenix Labs, um, working with some of uh, my very good friends in the industry, I decided, you know what, it's it's time to start this thing over again. And, um, you know, I got co-founders this time, which I didn't have in Ghostly Bear, which uh, was rough. Uh, and so I had a couple of friends who were also looking to start something. Um, and we aligned on what it was and what we wanted to do and all the things that uh, we wanted to build. And we came out of the gate swinging uh, earlier this year. And so that's that's sort of how we got got here to Jam and T. Love it. I'm happier with your friends and building something awesome. That's the yeah. best. Yes. And you, ha you had an experience at Phoenix Labs. How big were they when you started? Probably not that big, right? And they really scaled? Yeah, they they did really scale. I think I joined when we were in the a little bit north of a hundred folks, um, and so it was right around the time that they were originally acquired by Garena, um, and so they had one game under their belt, Dauntless, which uh, had come out and were doing well. But uh, with uh, Garena acquiring them, um, they were really thinking about what is game two, and Garena was like, "Hey, what if you thought about more than just game two, but like maybe multiple games in development?" Um, yeah. and so, uh, I really spent a bunch of time helping them figure that out and scale up. And I think when I left, they were three, like just North of 300. So yeah. big growth and Fay Farm's yeah. doing so well. Yes. And Fay Farm, Fay Farm has come out and is doing really well. And, uh, really excited to see that team, uh, get all the love that they deserve for that. I love that. They're good people. They are. So you have a background in social design. Mm -hmm. Walk me through how companies should think about bringing players together sure uh so as as background uh i i got a crash course in social design at league um i was part of the original player behavior team that came together um and started trying to tackle that on league which is uh definitely a uh a an exciting environment to think about uh, player behavior issues and 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 social design um but it really led me down this path of doing research and, and understanding what we were building and how we were thinking about it. Um, I read a ton of articles and information about um, how social design works, you know, and this is an area that a ton of folks in the industry have been thinking about since, you know, the days of MUDs when it was all text-based. You know, there are uh, very famous articles um, by Richard Bartle and Raf Koster and Dan Cook. Um, you know, and just consuming a ton of those really helped give me a foundation for how to think about how players interact and and what they need. Um, and I think the biggest and easiest piece for me is it's a lot of things that apply uh, to just bringing people together. So when you think about how you bring together a sports team or how you think together about bringing, uh, you know, a work group or a you know the after school uh softball league or anything like any of these sorts of social gatherings have these elements that um play into social design and you just have to be really diligent about how you're building them in the digital space um and so things like understanding how players have identity and express that identity 
um, and how folks begin to recognize that identity and what recognition means in a digital environment um, is a lot of the foundation for social design, right? Um, in many cases, I think that we we underestimate um, how hard it is to build identities in digital spaces. Humans are sort of built to recognize faces really well um, and less built to recognize it uh usernames and a uh, series of numbers and you know whatever digital avatar you may have in the game um my my uh, favorite example of this is i had been talking to a friend who worked on destiny 2 for a while and i was like oh you know when you're in the tower you should be matched with the same friends like or the same people over and over again so you have a chance to recognize them um, and she was like, oh, yeah, that was in since the beginning. When you go into tower instances, you're generally put in the same tower instances as people you've been in the same tower with before. Uh, yeah. But because we have such a hard time recognizing usernames really distinctly and because, you know, within Destiny, everyone doesn't look exactly the same, but there's definitely uh, not as much distinction um, as human faces, for example. It's just very easy to miss that you're with that group the whole time. So, you know, even just thinking about that foundational topic of like, you know, how do you put people together so that that identity is recognizable and uh, you can get used to seeing the same people? Because that ends up building the foundation of how folks have trust and belonging in a community and can recognize and get a sense of, oh, I know what I'm going to get out of this connection and have a sense of social norms about it. Um, the example I like to give is like, if you go into, so I'm a big tabletop gamer. And so I have a friendly local game store that I go to on the regular, right? Um, and so every time you walk into that store, you know, and you can apply this to gyms or cafes or wherever, you sort of look around and you see the regulars, right? Like you see the people like you always see there and yeah. you're not necessarily friends with them, right? Like you're not inviting them over for for drinks after work or anything, but uh, you're like, oh, I know that player and I know that player. Oh, so-and-so showed up, right? Um, and because you have that recognition, you sort of have an expectation of like, oh, if I sit down with that player, they're going to play a blue deck in Magic or, uh, oh, they play Empire and X-Wing, right? Um, and that actually really helps form a connection of like how you feel connected to that community, what you feel like you're valued for in the community, because you know that you know, when they see you, they're like, oh, there's Carl. He's going to bring his Ahsoka Shatterpoint army or he's going to bring his stupid blue green deck uh, in commander. Right. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. And the, and because you know what you're valued for and because you have a sense of what you value in others in that environment, um, you just feel really connected to that community and you feel a sense of belonging. Um, and that's really important for us as humans um let alone like you know the the health of a given community it's just super important for us as humans um and so you know i think that having that stuff in mind is really important um and one of the things that i think we stumble with in the game industry is we do uh things to try and make it safer but in some way or or faster to play more more efficient more uh easy for players to engage with the game itself um and in turn accidentally do things that harms that sense of identity and recognition right um my favorite example is marvel snap uh which is a pretty recent game when it came out um you know you you really didn't have any sense of who is the player you're playing against other than a username and in fact they sort of trained you to not really understand that that was another player because you played against so many bots early on um and so what that means is i love that game and i love talking to my friends about that game outside of that game but inside the game i treated it like a single player game right like i never interacted with my opponent because i was never sure if it was a bot or not right like um you know and so i just did my thing played my game you know hit play again um and i think that so much of that community and social design which i know that they've been adding over time could have come in from that day one of like how me and my friends talked about decks we were building and how we talked about strategies for snapping and all that kind of stuff like there's such a missed opportunity in my mind as a social designer for that to have been part of that community building inside the game from moment one um and you know having worked at riot and at a bunch of these companies like i know exactly why it happens right like 
you know, you want players to be able to hit the play again. And there's people who don't really want to interact because the, the, uh, you know, the community that League of Legends had at one point, you know, has helped train them along with, you know, the Call of Duties and the Counter-Strikes and all the out there, um, have trained them not to want to interact with, with the, the community. And I can understand how people get down that path, but I think, you know, as someone who is studying social design and also just like the role of loneliness and social connection in us as humans, I'm like, oh, but games could be so much more. They could do so much, you know? Um, and so uh, I always, I always jump on my soapbox when people talk to me about social design, about like, oh, you just need to start thinking about this stuff and introduce it because that level of players playing together just makes it so much more of a vibrant experience and can it can really make the the communities deeper and the things that many people jump to to make those communities safer actually make it worse because they accidentally dehumanize all the other players um yeah and and it can be it can be rough it can be hard but i think it's super worthwhile i love the games are really just like basic human psychology because i feel like you do want to know the people at your coffee shop. This is just human nature, right? Yep. And you do also really want to know what's going to happen next. Like to some degree, you know, if I do mm -hmm. this thing, what's in the future. So yep. I love that it's woven in. If somebody is trying to build a community on a new game, like early days, you, you highlighted some things, but what else should they really keep in mind if you're building from the start? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I would really encourage folks to um, go out and find the the articles and the GDC talks. You know, Dan Cook is uh, pretty well known for doing a bunch of papers and GD alongside GDC talks that talk about this stuff. Raf Koster is really well known, um, and increasingly, uh, you know, those are those are folks that have uh, been writing articles uh, since I've been at PopCap, if not longer. Um, but there are so many people who are writing stuff and thinking about this stuff. This is the Fair Play Alliance um, and uh, uh, Kimberly Vole, who's an advisor for us at Jam and You know, these are all folks who are putting a lot of effort into making what we already know easy to access and easy to find. Um, you know, and I think there's a ton of stuff that has been developed or been thought about or been discovered that folks can use as a stepping stone to figure out what's best for their game. Um, yeah. So I love you that. Know, we're, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. And so, you know, take advantage of it. Totally. I mean, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's so many people who have done so many businesses and tried so many things before you. So yep. it's like the best overall <laughs> advice too. Um, how can people go about getting a deeper understanding of their customers and their problems? Like ask them, but in what, in what way are people most receptive to being asked? How do you get the best player feedback? Do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's a whole host of patterns that you can do. Um, I think a lot of it is what you're specifically trying to learn. Um, a lot of it is uh, that I've super valued is watching how players uh, interact with a given game or a given genre and what they say, but also what they do, right? Like the yeah. classic, the classic uh, truism is players can't tell you what they want. Um, they can only show you what they want by how they act. Uh, they'll have opinions of what they want, but whether or not those opinions are correct uh, is not always reliable. But a lot of it is, you know, when I'm thinking about a new game idea or a new product that we're working on, I go to look for players that are playing games or adjacent genres that I think might have the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, and I'll try to get to know what are they playing? Why are they playing it? Right. Like what other games do they play? When do they jump around? You know, I'll jump into the communities and see um how players are talking about uh the games that they play what other games come up um i'll watch a lot of twitch streams of folks who are dedicated to that genre often um and see like okay you know if they're not a true variety streamer but they are like you know you have you have some uh streamers who are dedicated to like a single game but most often i find game uh there are streamers that are dedicated to mostly one game but really that genre and they'll jump around to other games in that genre and i think where they where they stay and where they don't stay and what what gap catches their eye you can learn a lot about like what problems are they actually looking to solve what's really um trying to hook them there 
Um, and so that's a lot of it. And so I think, you know, it is absolutely like asking them, but understanding that they're not going to be able to tell you exactly the answer. And so asking them questions yeah. around the problem and asking them what they do and, and, and as much as you can seeing what they do, right. Um, that's really good. The main thing that I tr tend to tell people is you should always go in with some, uh, hypothesis of what the answer is. Um, not because you necessarily just want to validate that you're right. You know, the, the, uh, there's a bunch of biases that you need to be careful of, but I think there are folks who go in and like, oh, we'll just ask and we'll find out what the answer is. And it's like, no, no, no. The way your brain works is you already think you know what the answer is and you'll find out information that either uh, uh, speaks to that or speaks against it, right? And so you might as well be really explicit about that of like, hey, I think that um, what League of Legends players really need is, uh, you know, one of the classic examples that a bunch of X writers will now laugh at is for a long time, we always said, uh, we had people who would come in and be like, oh, what I think League of Legends needs is a really good tutorial, right? Like your game's super hard to learn. What you really need is a tutorial. Um, and while there's a bunch of stuff that we should have done and, and, you know, that game has done since I've left to make that new player experience uh, better and smoother and easier onboarding, um, what it actually needed was easier ways for friends to bring you into a game and and play alongside you for your first few games because all the all the players that stuck around with league for a long time um generally were onboarded by friend and had friends help them with that early learning curve and having a difficult learning curve actually made those social connections better and made folks really enjoy spending that time with their friends and value having it and stick with the game longer as a result of making it through um and uh, you know, even if you came into the game as a solo player and managed to figure it all out, you still didn't stick around as much because you wouldn't have built those social connections that helped you play the game, right? Like a team-based game, you kind of want to, you want to have your crew, you want to have folks yeah. that you know you can rely on, you want to have folks that have that higher trust. And so being onboarded by friends ended up being a huge uh, difference in whether you were a, you know, a long-term League of Legends player or someone who was more of a Taurus. And, you know, often this worked as a double-edged sword, right? Like folks would come in with their friends and be really strong uh, players and stick around for a long time. And then, you know, life would happen, you know, folks would graduate college or get their jobs or, you know, uh, what have you. And then the friend group would sort of stop being online all at the same time. And then it sort of would, you would see a lot of players drop off at that point. Um, and so, you know, understanding the hypothesis of what you're trying to go after, right? Like when I came in, you know, to be to be transparent, one of my interview answers that uh, I later got yelled at about uh, was, oh, we, you know, I'm coming from PopCap. I know how to do tutorials. I know how to do onboarding. This is what League of Legends needed. Um, and my hypothesis was, oh, you're losing so many players because of this. That's what they need. Like these players that are going to leave need this thing. And then, um, you know, when you actually sat down to look at players and talk to players who have both made it through the onboarding um, as those that didn't, um, and then watch that behavior over time, what you found out was like, it wasn't just like a tutorial, but they needed help with that low trust and teammate environment, right? Like they need someone to help them um, feel safe in, you know, the pickup basketball game that they just accidented it into, right? Um, and so, you know, it's not just about like a tutorial was never going to make them feel safer. Uh, it might've given yeah. them some more basics, but it's like, okay, how do we introduce you to someone that can help you feel okay when you show up to the, to the, you know, um, game stores actually face this problem all the time. You know, someone shows up to the game night the first time and they're like, there's all these people. I have no idea if they're sharks or if they're like noobs like me. I don't know who plays what games, you know, how do I have that first great game experience at my local game shop um you know and there are game stores that really keep an eye out for those players so that they can have that thing of like let me build that social connection with you right away um uh and so i think you know as you're as you're finding out about your players and the things that they need really keeping in, keeping an eye towards what do i think that they need and then what does the behavior and how do I, how am I hearing their problems and how does that line up or not line up to what my assumptions are? Um, and I think uh, jumping way back, because I've 
rambled and lost the thread. Um, if you have a really thoughtful set of, I call them assertions and assumptions, but it's like scientific method hypothesis. If you have a really thoughtful list of that stuff, then you can very quickly see like, oh, I just heard and saw this from a player and that totally lines up with these three hypotheses um, or the, these three assumptions, but this one is way off. Something's going on. Let me dig in further. Um, and that just helps you learn and iterate towards what the right solutions are so much faster. Um, whereas if you don't have it written down, you're just shooting in the wind and you'll forget what you assumed and you'll you'll forget what you saw so quickly. Um, and so uh, being really thoughtful about it and being really diligent about writing stuff down, I think is the most important part of asking those questions. You're a great business leader because I feel like all, all this player behavior research is kind of like employee behavior <laughs> research. Like how do you make your team stay engaged and all of that? It really mm -hmm. correlates. And I know you're passionate about building leaders and building communities within a company as well. Can mm -hmm. you talk to me about that correlation and how you think about building a company and supporting your team? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it absolutely uh, is highly correlative. I mean, like a, a company is a community, right? Like totally. you're bringing, bringing together a community to accomplish a set of goals and you need that community to work in as high of a trust environment as possible. Uh, and so many of the the things that you think about when you're thinking about social design for games are, in fact, also thinking about social design for any community you're putting together whatsoever, right? Um, you know, and uh, one of my other founders uh, likes to call this my theory of dog fooding, uh, dog fooding social design through through the company. Um, dog fooding, if uh, you're not familiar with the term, is this idea that like. Uh, if you want to sell a product, you need to you need to try the product first, right? Like it before you sell dog food to a dog, you should eat, eat the dog food to make sure <laughs> that it's not uh, terrible, uh, yeah, uh, or at least won't kill you, right? Um, uh, and so you know, a lot of what I talk about of like you know what I want to be able to do is build these really vibrant player communities with great social design. And in order to do that, we have to be able to do that internally. Like I have to be able. Totally. If I can't build a great community at Jam and T, how will Jam and T ever build a great community with its players, right? Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, the implementation is different at a, you know, right now we're seven people, right? Like, and so it's a very different implementation than when you're talking about uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of players, but um, many of the baseline principles are the same. How you think about onboarding folks uh, is yeah. the same. Um, and so, you know, these these are really clear matches. And I think um, what I often return to is the role that games has often played in, um, you know, not to sound too grandiose, but within human society has, you know, in human civilization has been these, these moments that can help build communities. They, they can form community really easily because because of the rules, they uh, allow for really clear social norms and meeting it and exceeding expectations and moments of exchanging of trust. Um, and they can be these formations of uh, sort of the the center that holds these uh, communities together, right? Like, and whether that that game is actually a sport like football or chess and chess clubs, um, you know, this this has always sort of been the role of games is like play is this safe place where you can extend vulnerability in order to build those social connections right um and so really thinking about that you know not just as we build games and the role that our games can play in society but also thinking about it of like okay how do you use these tools that we use in games all the time to uh build that social connection and build that framework and create systems within studios that build a trust right um you know, it, it it's something, it's a really clear opportunity. And like uh, one of the uh, truisms that I always hold to is that teams move at the speed of trust. Um, and so the more teams trust each other, the faster they'll move, the more they'll have each other's back, um, the, the harder and thornier problems they'll be able to take on. Um, and so a lot of how I build studios um, and studio culture is thinking about, okay, what are the, what are the systems we have in play that Build trust, reward trust, um, and and make it really easy for everyone at the studio to 
uh, have a clear understanding of the actions that they're doing to to build trust with each other and with the the community. Um, and and what are the things that we have going on that might accidentally erode trust, right? Like, because I don't think anyone goes into a company being like, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna erode all the trust here," or like build systems totally. that are meant to do that. But like, okay, where are we accidentally eroding trust? Whether it's uh, you know, hey, you have to form out fill out expense reports in this specific way, and that makes it feel like I don't trust you, and like, um, or you know, how do we have PTO set up in a way that that erodes trust? Um, you know, or even how do we do work assignments in a way that doesn't actively build trust, right? Um, thinking about that and, and, and applying, you know, systems design, game design lens to it um, to yeah. understand, hey, where where are we rewarding the right things and where are we rewarding the wrong things and how do we how do we fix that? You talked a bit about um, Twitch, and mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about just marketing these days how do you market a game to your communities in a way that feels authentic but also brings players in and mm -hmm. talk to me about influencer marketing talk to me about all the things that are hot right now and how you think that builds communities and builds players yeah uh marketing is hard right now um getting getting your game seen is yeah. really difficult when there are um the amount of just and not even games but the amount of like my Steam backlog almost doesn't hold a candle at this point to my streaming and uh, uh, what is it, uh, Premiere TV uh, backlog and my movie backlog and all this stuff. Um, there are just so many things fighting for our attention these days. Um, yeah. What I tend to gravitate towards myself as a player, um, and I'm not necessarily, you know, everybody's target player, but I think it it does speak to some broader themes. I listen to what my friends are playing and why they're playing them, right? Like my friends, when my friend says, oh, hey, you really need to check out um, the, the new Diablo season. Like, I think it's going to be really cool, um, especially if they're like, do you want to play together, right? Like that, yeah. will, that will grab my attention really fast. Um, you know, and, and same is true for, for TV. Like the only TV shows I even spend the time watching anymore are ones that my friends are like, oh, no, no, no this is worth the time. For sure. Um, uh, extends these days to not just my like active local friends that i know in real life and have spent time with but um you know the the parasocial friends i have on all the social media like uh i tend to trust what dr lupo says because i've watched him stream for a long time and i know how my interests in games aligns with his interests in games right um i like what he likes about tarkov as an example even though i don't actually enjoy playing that game very much um i like what he likes about tarkov um you know and the same is true for you know a thousand uh factory game streamers like i i keep a close watch on milaus uh, just to see whatever new factory game is coming out, because that's the one that I know I'm going to enjoy playing, right? Um, and yeah. so I think, and I think this is true for uh, many players, right? Like they they understand who amongst not just their local friends, but also their parasocial friends um, have tastes that line up, and who who do they trust, and who lines up with what they enjoy, um, and they pay really close attention to that. Um, and I think that the more you can find those communities of folks, like you're building a game for a community. Um, uh, and so finding where that community is, who are the folks who uh, are at the forefront of that, especially on the influencer space. And I think building a relationship with those folks, you know, early on in order to be like, hey, I'm theoretically building a game for the community that you represent. Is this actually scratching an itch, right? Like, um, or even like, hey, I think I'm building a, uh, a game for you but what like let me talk to you to validate that and make sure i know that um but then as it goes you know building building that community with those folks involved will also jumpstart your ability to start to break through because the people that your target player trusts will be playing and advocating for the game because they have familiarity with it um they're potentially part of the early community like we're in pre-alphas or, or betas um and, and you can start to not just you know be heard but also be sure that you're delivering an experience that is what those players are super interested in and what they want um and even you know where you're trying to surprise those players in certain ways you you can surprise them right like i think that um 
in many ways, Baldur's Gate 3 and uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom this year are two great successes that were really built on the backs of existing communities and that those, you know, studios knew those communities inside and out and knew knew how to both uh, play into those expectations, but also subvert those expectations. You know, I think yeah. Breath of the Wild was an incredible success and Nintendo clearly paid attention to what that community was and what they were interested in and how to surprise and delight them with the next one. And I think, you know, Larian with Baldur's Gate 3, they developed in, in public virtually for three years with the early access. And, you know, I think that built a lot of goodwill and a lot of interest. And you could see that the the influencers and streamers and community members who were incredibly vocal about it um, were so because they felt listened to, they felt part of the process, they felt heard. And that in turn totally. created this tidal wave of goodwill and interest and enthusiasm when they actually launched that, you know, helped them break through. Um, you know, and once you're once you're through to a certain point, you sort of like get the zeitgeist moment and and yeah. that carries you pretty far too. Um yeah. but I think that's that's how games have to work these days, right? Like I don't think we can drop a, you know, multi-million dollar uh or tens of millions or if not hundreds of millions ad yeah, campaign maybe more. And <laughs> break through and and hope right like um i think there have been games recently that have had that that big spend and and sort of come up empty but you know whether it's uh you know even if you go back a couple of years among us which was a game that had been out for two years just climbed the ranks because people discovered it and fell in love with it and then wanted to play with their friends who they couldn't see in person and it just spread like wildfire and i think that that community moment is so important um yeah but to do it you have to be really authentic you have to be a part of that community and that takes time to to build that relationship and connection so it also is scary right i think if you're building your game and you're only five months in and you're getting all this feedback and that's not a way in which you built a game before yep it can be really terrifying but yeah, I, 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 I think it's really hard to take feedback early, right? Like it's really hard to, you know, just on like none of us like to be vulnerable. Like it, it's it's scary totally. to put yourself out there, whether it's being on a podcast or whether it's, uh, you know, <laughs> running um, one, <laughs> running one, or yeah. showing the first draft of something, right? Like it's always sure. terrifying, and I think it's a very human nature to be like, oh, I just need a couple more months and I'll be ready. Yeah, um, it has to be perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, what also is uh, incredibly connecting between humans um, is recognizing that extension of vulnerability um, sure. and meeting it, right? Like, And so seeing that first draft and knowing it's a first draft and someone is still being very vulnerable and sharing it, like uh, humans resonate with that in many ways and, and will want to engage with it, especially when they're like, and I think they'll actually take my feedback because giving feedback yes. is, is in turn its own extension of vulnerability. Right. Um, and so I think that's part of the power there is that the ability to have both sides extend vulnerability and then have it return safely in that exchange of an early alpha, an early feedback session, an early play test, um, what have you is assuming it goes well, a way that that community and that trust is built so much faster, so much earlier, right? Um, and why that stuff can snowball so well. Um, but yeah, it, it is absolutely uh, incredibly scary. And and done, you know, if in done inartfully, um, you can not have that vulnerability returned and instead have it kind of stomped on. Um, and so you have to you have to be ready for it in some ways. But I do encourage folks to uh push themselves to be as vulnerable as they can early on because i think that where you can connect to the right players and the right audience and have that vulnerability return um you'll make a better game um you'll have a better time doing it and you'll build your community much earlier much stronger yeah for sure i know people are going to be really interested in just like the inner workings of riot i mean whatever you're able to share but why do you think Riot has had the success that they've had? What did you witness inside mm -hmm. of Riot for so many years, founding a team that people could potentially take away and implement themselves in their own yeah. way? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Riot 
is uh, an interesting, you know, outlier in many ways in the industry, but it's a really fascinating company. So I joined in 2011. Um, I had started playing League right as it came out of beta um, and then joined, uh, gosh, I forget what, what my patch is. So like every after a while, everyone was sort of known by the patch. Oh, I was patch of Lee Sin. Um, so I, I joined the studio the day that Lee Sin was uh, uh, initially put into the game. Um, and so uh, it was still figuring out how to support this game that had you know, taken the world by storm and had become so popular so quickly and was uh, building up really fast. I, I often say that I was like employee 250 something because I can never remember my exact employee number, but like it was there ish. Wow. Um, and so, you know, over the next six years while I was there, like when I left, they were 3,500 worldwide, I think. Um, Wild. And so like a crazy amount of growth. Um, and what really kept the studio focused on the player during that time was that relentless drumbeat of it's about the player experience. It's about how do we meet players, where they are, how do we deliver something that is what they want. Um, always think of these things not through business decisions, but through player experience decisions, right? Um, and I think that is a really strong drumbeat for um not just that studio, but thinking about games in general, right? Like having a really clear North Star, a really clear, uh, you know, driving force towards your decisions and a razor that helps you say what's in or out. Um, yeah. And and I think that was by far the, the strongest drumbeat. They had additional ones around their culture and how they wanted to operate and how we wanted to treat each other and what does, you know, being a writer mean? And I think many of the other uh, uh, values um have changed over time not in huge ways but in in ways that they most often in ways that they express them um okay. of, as they like uh you know for a long time i don't think it's one of the one of the values anymore but for a long time one of the the values was challenge convention right like we don't want to always do the way th just because it's been done this way before we don't want to necessarily by default do that and i think for a time that served right very 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 well um, you know, in, in figuring out uh how to do things differently when they're, you know, they had this game that was a complete outlier. Like League of Legends operated at a scale that no other game had really operated at before uh it sort of took off. And so there were many places where they couldn't do what had been done before because that was yeah. there was no playbook, right? Um, but I think over time, you know, as with all of these things, it became a like, oh, well, we always have to do things differently. Even if we've done it one way, we have to do it differently by four, not because it's the right thing to do, but because that's our value and we need to tell yeah. it, right? <laughs> um, and so I think, it, I believe it, they, the, the, the spirit of that is still absolutely in the DNA of Riot. Um, how they express it, though, is more nuanced, more tempered by where they are at their stage. Um, but the player experience first, I don't think has ever wavered or ever changed for them. Um, and so I think like that did very well for them um, and, and really drove not just the success of Riot um, internally, but also what has driven many of the uh, folks who've come out and started studios or gone on to do other things within the industry. One of the things that I know um, has helped drive that is that not just drive to think about the player experience, but how Riot thought about it and train people to think about it and be diligent about it. Um, that has ended up being a strength, I think, for everyone who's spun out of Riot, uh, especially in the startup space. And so There's I think, yeah. Uh, and so I think that's sort of what drove that. Um, I think also like Riot had a drive to be multiple games and, and has a infamously long R&D period for many of its games. Um, and I think that was also part of why you see so many people end up spinning out of Riot um, and go to start their own studio is I think there's a lot of good culture of how to think about business and games and, and thinking about new games that come from that and thinking about the audience. Um, but there are a studio that can only make so many games at a time, um, especially with the, the, the link that they spend on each game um, that yeah. I think you end up with folks who are trained to be very hungry in this way. And then, uh, want to go and build the thing that they're excited about. And so they end up spinning out of Riot and going to build the thing that they're excited about. 
Um, you know, uh, I think uh, the the company that it most reminds me of in this particular way is previously uh, Zynga. So Zynga is very famous for having a bunch of folks spin out of Zynga and become startups. Uh, and part of their reason is very similar in that they had a uh, R&D process uh, and a pitching process that was very structured, very thoughtful of like, how do you make the next game at Zynga? And obviously Zynga could only make so many games, but because that process existed, it trained an army of folks of how yeah. to pitch games to VCs and how to pitch game studios. Um, and so you saw a bunch of people spin out. And similarly with Riot, I think uh, Riot has been very successful at training a bunch of leaders how to think about building player experiences and how to cut through the noise and value something and then only has so many opportunities for those folks. And so you'll, I think you'll consistently see folks spin out um, to go and start their own thing. Yeah, there were so many ex-Riot studios. I feel like all the studios that were announced for a period of time where X yep. Riot founders raised whatever money. Yep. You said you learned a lot from all your time at Riot, but you learned a lot yeah. from your first startup too. If you mm -hmm. could go back and tell yourself some lessons or, you know, just share your learnings. Like, what do you yeah, wish you knew starting your studio? What did you learn along the way? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, starting your own studio, being a first time founder, you're always kind of an idiot. Um, because that's inherently the, the, the things you learn about about founding, um, doing anything for the first time. You're always kind of bad at the thing you, you do for the first time. Um, yeah. The big things that I sort of reflect on um, that I I don't regret because like I, one, I think regret is kind of a useless emotion and it, and it, the, the mistakes got me here, but the things that I'm like, totally. oh, if, if I were to replicate it uh, somehow yes. magically, here's how I would change it. I wouldn't yeah. solo found. Um, I think Founding a studio and a company in general is a lot, and it puts a lot on your shoulders. That is not just like the anxiety of, uh, you know, being in a job, but also this intangible anxiety of folks, you know, relying on you for their their income, and their mortgages, and their livelihood. Their health. Exactly. Yes. Um, that it's just a lot to shoulder as a single person, and then it also makes it hard for you to ever turn off because you're always just thinking about this stuff and like you can't take vacation because if you take vacation who worries about payroll right um and so uh one of the reasons why i'm not solo founding jam and t is exactly that lesson right like of thinking through that stuff um the other lesson uh i took that is uh probably also pretty valuable for folks is um when i went into it i got advice that vc had sort of pulled out of games um so this was Early 2017, I was looking at founding the studio and uh, some friends who had been in there and been been VC back were like, hey, there's been a bunch of uh, problems and game closures and stuff. Um, and so, you know, VC is really pulled out. You really want to go with a publisher um, and you really want to do that stuff. Um, and so I focused on building a publisher build and really focused on, on that as our path. And so, like, I raised my very initial money more through friends and family and then kind of went dark and put my head uh, deep in development for almost a year. Um, and by the time I came out, publishers were still an interesting uh, path. They were still putting money into the thing, but the game I built actually wasn't really good for publishers. And in the meantime, VCs had also come out of the woodwork and been reinvested in games. Yeah. Uh, and so Ghostly Bird probably would have been still going if I had learned to talk to VCs earlier. Um, but I was so optimized to talk to publishers that the few conversations I had with family funds and VCs, I totally whiffed. Like I told them the wrong things. Um, I focused on the wrong subjects. They were interested in like, you know, how do I think about it from um, this long-term business and this company and, you know, equity and how am I, what is my valuation? And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know. I need this much money to build this game and ship it. And <laughs> don't you want to know about the game and this beautiful world I've created? And let me know. They're like, no, 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 no. But who's your team? Like, what's the pedigree? All this stuff. Yeah. And like, um, it's funny because a couple of the folks that I talked to at that time who were very nice are actually invested in us this time, um, hmm. which I'm, you know, endlessly grateful for. Uh, but, you know, I was definitely just totally out of my depth uh, talking to those folks, uh, you know, and so that led to a bunch of questions around pivoting and, and decisions that you know, I've also learned lessons from, but the biggest one, you know, was that like, hey, when you're going to go start a studio, you have to understand you're starting this business. 
Um, and there's many ways to get funding for that business. And not all sources of funding are one for one what the business, what your business at the time will need, right? Like depending on what you're building, building, you could be really great for publishers. You could be really great for, you know, VCs. You could be really great for uh, angel investors or uh, strategic investors um, and understanding what each of those groups are and what they want and what the differences are and who's optimized for what and understand that it changes on a three month basis, right? So like whatever you learned three months ago is kind of wrong now, maybe. Um, you know, we started 2023 with, uh, the market's incredibly hard and, you know, you can't get anything in late stages, but seed round, you're still getting investing and we got around thankfully, but, um, it has been hard, but now there's signs that, oh, Hey, now late stage is more of a thing and seed is maybe shrinking again, you know, um, all this stuff changes so fast, right. That it's more. As you're starting out, you have to be like, here's how I talk to a publisher. Here's how I talk to a strategic. Here's how I talk to a VC. Here's how I understand my business so I can pivot uh, explaining that business to each of these folks. Uh, and just, you know, you have to be able to roll with the punches really well. Uh, and so, yeah. you know, a lot of a lot of the things that I look back now at you know, all the ways uh, I messed up Ghostly Bear. That's that's the one that I'm like, ah, I, I'm going to really overlearn this lesson now as much as possible. <laughs> um, the other thing, the other things along the way, you know, like there there's lessons to learn for sure, but learning how to be, how to be able to roll with the punches and be adaptable to the funding uh, market is super important. So. Yeah. Where did you learn how to pitch and how to think about all the different relations? Because that's, I think a lot of people's problem. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I'm lucky in that I have a bunch of friends who have gone down the various paths before, um, you know, and that has definitely helped. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, the, I will put on my old man yelling at sky, uh, moment, you know, kids these days have it great. Uh, you know, with, with all the information and in YouTube and so many people are putting yes. so much information out there. It's, it's really remarkable how well prepared you can be for probably almost anything at this point. Um, but, you know, there are tons of investors and publishers who are really explicit about like, hey, here's what we think about and what we care about. Um, here's how we think about it. You can find lots and lots and lots of information out there about it. And so like as a baseline, I think you can get a really good baseline just through um, some Google searches, some spending some time on TechCrunch or, or game developer. Um, the other part that I always emphasize is like, uh, you should always be respectful and recognize that other humans are on the end of it and they, they have their own time and attention, but most people in the game industry, especially most founders or, uh, VCs or, um, folks who work in publishing are more than happy to talk to folks like yes. just as, as a, like, Hey, I want to learn more about this. I'm thinking about this in the far distant future. And I just want to learn more. I'd love to pick your brain. Most people are so happy to talk about um, uh, their specific backgrounds, how they think about these problems that you can learn so much. And I think people, uh, again, it's vulnerability, right? Like it's it's hard to put yeah. yourself out there. It's it's scary, and um, you know, people people ask for stuff all the time. Um, and you know, you'll be surprised at how often people will be willing to share their time and lesson and attentions. And like, I've gotten a ton of that you know, partially after I already went through the crucible, right? Like, and I made a bench network connection through that. And, you know, I learned what VCs wanted because the VC across the table is being like, you're an idiot kid who has told me absolutely nothing I need to hear. Here's what I wanted to hear. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, next That's time. That's helpful though. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely helpful, but you know, uh, you don't have to necessarily completely fail at it. I could have asked them, you know, ahead of time and find, found out. And so, um, you know, I think, Asking, asking uh, to build upon the knowledge that you build from a baseline of uh, reading all the information that's out there, uh, I think is the best ways. Uh, and it's what you sort of have to build because it changes so fast anyway that it's like you. There's no one way to learn because you have to be able to, you know, what's the latest, what's the latest ones, and if you have those network connections um, and build up those relationships by asking folks. Um, uh, you know, lessons and, and to teach you and, and to talk about this stuff. 
Um, you'll also more more often than not build relationships where they'll be like, oh, hey, that thing that I told you six months ago, yeah, it's totally wrong now. It's this thing now instead, right? Um, yeah. That can be incredibly valuable. But you have to ask. I think that's always like everything. I hear my podcast, reach out to someone, be authentic, be vulnerable, ask for help. Yeah. They'll help you. Just yeah. have to ask. I have one last question before I ask it. I want to point people to your website, jam and dot studio. Yep. Let's pretend we're at an awards banquet and you're winning a lifetime achievement award. Maybe it's a game award, like game of the year, something really big. Who would you think uh, professionally who's made the biggest impact on your personal career? Oh, geez. Um, there are so many people. There are so yeah. many people. It's not for okay. asked for just one. Um, okay, many people who are all of the oh, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think so much of who I am as a leader is, uh, you know, thanks to uh, folks like Jesse Houston, Jay Moldenhauer, Salazar, uh, Travis George, Mark Merrill, Steve Snow, these folks who really helped shape me on that side. Um, on the game design side, it's, you know, uh, goes all the way back to like Jason Kapalka at PopCap. Um, you know, and uh, Dan Cook and Ralph Koster and all the other social design giants whom I am lucky enough to uh, have been able to read their research to to learn what I learn what I know. Um, you know, from a leader, from a like just building a company and empathetic uh, leadership standpoint, Samantha Bong, uh, who's the COO at Gem and T, um, has been a lifelong friend and and taught me a ton. Hans Reifenrath. Uh, you know, these folks who have been close to me and watched me grow up in so many ways and, and help keep me in line. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, you know, certainly if, if we're if we're closing our eyes and imagining the beautiful future award ceremony, then, you know, I'd definitely be remiss to to not thank Aaron and Yi Chao, my co-founders, who uh, I'm currently already relying on. And I can only imagine in the future I will be desperately reliant on um, to continue to exist. So um yeah there's you know it's uh there's always a huge community behind any individual who wins an award right like and oh. um you know yeah. i'm always deeply 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 grateful for the community of folks who have always invested in me and kept me going and and taught me what i know and like i would be nowhere without that amazing community of game developers and friends and and folks who have touched my lives in a, in a million ways so there you go. Community is everything. True. Yep. We've been talking to Carl Quo, founder of Jam and T Studio. Carl, where can people go to reach out to you personally or follow along with Jam and T? Yeah, Jam and T Studio is our website that you mentioned before. You can find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. Um, Twitter uh, or X, I guess they're calling it. X. I'm, status <laughs> yeah. I'm status quo. I'm pretty much status quo on everything um and then uh you know if you want to if you want to reach out for mentorship or um just asking questions about uh the game industry cquo at jamnt.studio happy to field whatever emails i can through that so thanks so much thanks so much for listening to the show this week to catch all the latest from here's waldo you can follow us on linkedin be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes we'll see you next time